Yeah, so afternoon people. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm happy to speak here, I'm honored. And um, I just want to touch on, on a project that I worked on, or still work on, um, and specifically used as part of my master's as well in the context of the role of design thinking and how that affects or enhances brand strategy. At Vega, I teach brand strategy, and um, so I was really looking at that. And often in, in studies, um, you know, we, we talk about what worked. But in this case, we, we wanted to know what didn't work um, and why not in the first, you know, the first part of it. So, yes, um, it is, I mean, Super Guava is a, is a project that I suppose shows up all kinds of subtle and, you know, um, well, all kinds of prejudice in, in our society. Um, she just happens to be, you know, a lesbian superhero. Well, she's an ex accidental hero, really. She lives in Leti Span with her wife, Letitia. And um, she's got a bookshop. And, yeah, her nemesis is Mefrou Domni Kukamur. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's got an Afrikaans kind of angle. But it is, you know, the idea is the themes are obviously quite, quite universal. Um, it's, it's looking, well, I'm going to show you what it looked like. Um, and if you want to chat about where it's now, you're welcome to, especially if you have lots of money. Okay, so um, that's the initial kind of characters that I can't draw, but um, that a very talented animator uh, drew as well. The quality on the screen is not so great, but she's there in the corner, um, standing next to Peanut, uh, who is a telepathic dog. And there's uh, Manon, the local town's fa town fairy, and then Nefro Domni Kukamur, who's a has-been, so she's an ex-lesbian, and then she found God in the Domni. Um, anyway, so, um, anyway, yeah, so we started to, to kind of challenge that or, and, and kind of trying to, to look at a voice, and we're still developing the voice, but in terms of today's discussion, it's kind of saying, okay, what didn't work? That's what she often says, so I can't apologize for her. But um, in terms of saying, okay, what, what didn't work? Because we were a group of people, very different, you know, skill sets, um, but the, the point of what I want to chat about is we in design thinking often start to, well, we talk about empathy, we talk about all the processes in design thinking, but it's always outwardly focused. So it's about empathy with the people that we're going to work with. But one of the key challenges is how do you create empathy within the team that's facilitating? And that specific angle is, is important to, I suppose, research f um, further. There is some at UCT, or, or sorry, at CPUT, who is doing a doctorate in empathy, which would be very um, engaging. So, yeah, so the question was, um, okay, so what do we do with the team internally? How do we get ready um, to ensure that all those different skill set sets, the transdisciplinary thinking actually works, and the engineers, and the psychologist and the marketers, uh, for instance, talk to each other because often engineers think marketers smoke something funny and yeah, marketers often think that engineers are a bit touched. So, so it is in, in that context also that we, we wanted to kind of glean a bit more insight. But I'm not going to go into that um, in, in detail. I'll just look at some themes that, that ki kind of came out of the study in terms of a thematic analysis. And also a little, I, I don't want to call it a model, because it's still, it's something I looked at in my master's, kind of um, distilled in my master's, but just in terms of looking at how do we, are we in design thinking, are the current models, do they go deep enough in terms of, you know, empathy levels, do they go deep enough to understand the different, the different aspects, the five different aspects that the D school at Stanford, for instance, put forward. So. What I did was, and I'm not a designer, so please excuse me. Um, yeah, so it's not that clear, but anyway, so <coughs> bless you. So the blocks in the middle talk about that's the classical design thinking at Stanford model. It starts, I don't know, who, who knows the model? I'm going to teach you stuff you know. Okay, so it is starts kind of saying, well, how do we solve wicked problems? and um, complex problems in society. So if you don't have empathy, if you don't immerse yourself through ethnography, all of that, 
um, really stand in people's shoes, how are you going to be able to solve the problem for them uh, or with them actually because design thinking is not about telling people how to solve their problems, they are telling you, you just facilitate. So, um, so you start with em empathy, the empathy phase in terms of really drilling down, really understanding the people you want to work with, what are their challenges and what is the, the real problem that you go on to then in the second phase in terms of defining that problem. Um, because often we have 15 key issues and 12 problems. What is the, the key one? What's the wicked problem that's very complex and hard to solve but the most relevant? So, and then you go into the ideation phase. So there are different models but they all kind of talk similar kind of um, language and directions. Um, so ideate as in really kind of exploring all kinds of ideas um, and then starting to, to pull it back and starting to filter and starting to distill. So I'm not doing it justice in terms of all its depth, um, but yes, uh, that's the process where you really need to be able to work together in terms of finding real solutions. Um, and that's why my, my, you know, for me it's that team dynamic is, is really important and we often struggle with that. And in our study, that was one of the key you know, themes we found. And specifically because what I realized later was we were all introverts. So, um, and we were trying to, you know, collaborate in the classical way, which doesn't work for introverts. Not that we can't introvert, uh, introvert um, interact and, and brainstorm effectively. Um, okay, so then the next phase is then, okay, I've got my idea, we've got, we've got our focus. Then how do we now kind of see if it can work in terms of rapid prototyping, um, kind of just starting to play around with that concept and then testing it with, with our users as well to kind of see, okay, well, the problem was defined. Is this kind of talking to the, to the problem or do we need to reiterate the whole time, which with design thinking often happens if you really want to address the problem. Um, and then, yeah, so then you test. So what I then did was kind of say, okay, that's a Stanford robust model, very recognized school. We've got a, a new D school at UCT, which is also born out of the same, the same school at Stanford. Um, so I kind of said, okay, uh, how do we kind of grow, go deeper? So firstly, I then looked at Paul Pangaro's work in terms of how we took design thinking and the current model and evolved it into design for conversations, as he call, calls it. To kind of really look at, are we speaking you know, to each other in the right way? Are we creating the, uh, you know, a culture when we start as a group? Or are we, do we just launch into it and hope that we're going to find some, some knowledge and, and some you know, agreement somewhere down the line? So it's very important that you, in terms of creating a context. It sounds obvious, but often it doesn't happen. Okay, so, and his process is then, in terms of his different ways of, of communicating, and it very much links quite well with the Stanford the five, five stages as well. So you can already see there's an evolution and a deeper, um, a deeper level of exploration as well, and it builds more empathy. Um, it's a real tool that can help to, to really reinforce that even more. Um, and then I looked at typical in, in transdisciplinary thinking, at Bruce Tuckman, which is a 1960s um, academic in terms of group dynamics within business. And he might be from 1960s, or his work might be, but it was, you know, reapplied, retested um, in 2011, as far as I know, and it's still relevant. And his phases in terms of understanding how people work, um, similar to Pangaro, is saying, well, there's the forming phase of this group. It's un you know everyone's uncomfortable, kind of you know on your phone these days, I suppose, not making eye contact. Um, and then you know you kind of then start with a storming phase in terms of okay now we starting to explore. We gradually starting to engage more with each other. So we're still not so sure, um, you know, in terms of dynamic, in terms of our own sharing, but it is you know gradually getting better, hopefully. Um, Obviously, leadership does help in that case, but only to a point. Um, and then, in terms of norming, kind of then looking at, at starting to distill. Again, if you look at the ideation phase, is you know there's kind of that link. Um, and now I can't read. Uh, performing, um, similar to the prototyping process, where the team has to now create something um, as well. And um, 
then adjourning, I think, um, where, yeah, adjourning where the team now disperses, or they can keep working on a new project as well, creating a new different dynamic as, as new players will come in. So the point is, it, it's kind of giving a bit more structure in terms of design and design thinking, which might be might feel a bit loose um, to you know people from very different um, backgrounds and skill sets. So that's why Tuckman also then kind of brought a bit of a more structure. And so what I was looking at is saying, well, th that's possibly a kind of way of thinking that one can take forward to really drill deeper into design thinking um, and evolve the process. A lot of people don't like the word design thinking, but yeah, I'm not going to go into in that discussion at the moment. So um, yeah, so that was the, the essence of it. And in terms of Super Guava, then looking at some themes that emerged, and kind of say, well, um, we need some evolutionary leadership, or there's creative leadership. There's many types. As long as there is real leadership, conscious leadership that we're looking at in the 21st century. Um, it sounds once again obvious, but often, you know, you get into a group situation and who's leading? Why should I respect you? Um, because we're all, you know, specialists and, you know, it's hard to park our egos as well. Um, then it is collective buy-in and empathy because you can have as much empathy as you want, but you need buy-in in terms of how you're going to go forward even buying into the current challenge and making sure you speak the same language in terms of what is the challenge. And um, that's often one of the biggest problems, is defining the problem, defining the challenge within your team, but then also the wicked problem with the, uh, the victims you work with. And I'm just joking, with the, with the communities that you work with. Okay, so, and then I'll be here all day. Um, and then it is then kind of really understanding that in depth, you know, and collective understanding, but also getting real commitment. Once again, that's something that one has to, you know, commit to with a team um, explicitly. It's, it, it cannot be assumed. And once again, that often happens as well. And ironically, us as grown-ups, um, we sometimes struggle with these things. Um, and yeah, so now that we're testing, now that we're understanding a deeper conversation, we're starting to perform, in Tuckman's words, um, you know, do we have clarity? Do we have openness in terms of ideating? Um, and that in itself can be explored in depth because what is openness? Oh, you know, we once again come from very different backgrounds and skill sets, and so it's agreeing on that as well. Um, and then lastly, also looking at insightful reflection. Once again, it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of project management kind of theory as well. But it's saying, well, are we just ending the pro are we just adjourning? Are we just walking away? Or are we reflecting and really understanding the value that this design project helped us in terms of our own personal growth, but in terms of also case studies that, that you know, could be shared um, with, uh, with other people. So, I mean, that's in a nutshell. And then I've got three slides of references, you know, just to bulk it up and look like I'm learning. Um, yeah, so that's, that's in a nutshell. So if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you.